Hi, my name is Chuck Satterley. I am the co-creator and writer of Monsters in Midways uh, with the Kickstarter currently live. You can see all links to that at Defective Comics, IX instead of ICS.com. And you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hello, my name is Jeremy Megertz, and I am the co-creator and artist on Monsters and Midways. You can find our book at DefectiveComics.com, and you can find me on social media, Jeremy Megert Art, uh, Twitter and Instagram, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today on this really cold and frigid Saturday uh, with two very talented individuals. They're actually a, a duo of a trio for this particular series. We're joined today by Chuck Satterley and Jeremy Meggert from Monsters and Midways. How are you both doing today? Doing fantastic. How are you? Doing good. As long as I didn't butcher your names, I, I think I did okay for an intro. <laughs> I think we're off and running. So for those that don't know anything about this particular comic, because this isn't a uh, uh, Kickstarter is ongoing currently for this particular comic. Tell us what it's all about and how we can support it so far. Monsters in Midways, in a nutshell, a 1970s uh, heavy metal guitarist hasn't done so well with his songs about uh, elves and magic and wizards. This book is about uh, how he does with the real thing. Um, it's based in 1976 Chicago. One of our main characters is Dave, who turns out to be a barbarian. And in our magical world, a barbarian is a very powerful fighter who can wield weapons uh, that are magical in origin. He is aided in his effort to save the world by a immortal wizard named Kessler and a magical weapon maker named Cat, some elves who are um, tasked with keeping dark magic at bay. Dark magic has been seeping in different parts of the world for all time. Dark magic is responsible for every monster in um, myth and legend, from the Loch Ness Monster to the Abominable Snowman to Bigfoot to dragons. That is how we explain uh, monsters. Dark magic uh, is also wielded by other immortal wizards who have gone um, essentially the way of a dark path. Think Sith, Lords, and Jedi. I have a Millennium Falcon background, so that's the best way I can put it. That's Monsters in Midways uh, at, a, um, at a glance. It's a six issue series. Uh, the floppies are coming out through Second Sight Publishing. Uh, one of America's only Black-owned publisher, comic book publishers, very proud of that. Right now, we have a Kickstarter going on. The Kickstarter is for a hardcover, collected sort of omnibus edition, oversized with um, all the scripts, sketches, everything involved in it, which will come out after the six issues are um, on the market. That's amazing. I also have to point out that when you scheduled for this interview as well, and this is a first for me. Um, you had a longer description than I've ever seen about both of your careers, which is amazing to see. And I, and I definitely want to touch upon that during this interview because I don't know if that's a bad thing. Or not. <laughs> no, that that's a good thing because usually it's just about the project itself. But I love the fact that you both have a, a wide history when it comes to uh, being creative in comics, and I love I love seeing that as well too. Jeremy, switching over to you real quick mm -hmm. here. When you first got the script for Monsters in Midways, what was the first thing that came to mind from a creative perspective? The first thing I got, even before I got the script, the kind of two things that that I look at is one is what what's the idea. Is it a good idea and does it sound, for me, you know, I don't do a lot of super serious, like heavy drama books. At least I haven't yet. It's got to sound fun and it's got to be something that when I read it, I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to have a great time drawing that. And so that was the first thing, you know, when you start talking about, you know, sword and sorcery and barbarians and wizards and, you know, monsters and the 70s and all that stuff, that really drew me to it. And also... Interestingly enough, like I think almost every book I have ever done has been sci-fi. 
like right before we started talking about doing this book, I was like, there was a little moment where I was like, okay, I would like a little break from sci-fi. And I was like, maybe I'll do with a superhero book or something, just something different. And when we started talking about this, I was like, yes, that's perfect. I can't wait to give that a shot. And, you know, when I got the scripts, you know, Chuck's scripts are, they're fantastic. You know, they're, they're so well written. I get to jump into them. One of the nice things about Chuck and his experience is I know that when I get Chuck's scripts on, on a comic page, there's certain kind of like rules and guidelines and stuff that a, that a comic artist has to follow with like talking order and actions and panels. And a very nice thing about Chuck's scripts is he like, there's no tweaking or changing. Like everything is, is followed. So I really just get to open it up and I just get to go straight to work on the layouts and the pages. And that just makes it fantastic on my end. So then uh, as the artist of this, of the series, then was there any character design or some flair that you added uh, based on your past experiences that kind of really set a character apart from others? A little bit. With these characters, because I had kind of come in after Chuck and Nick had cooked the idea a little bit. And so they kind of knew like what the characters were and a little bit of like some basic descriptions and what they looked like. I wasn't just going straight from scratch because anytime I work with somebody like that and they're like, hey, I kind of want the character to look like this. My goal is to deliver, you know, what they had in their head, but then like kind of take it to the next level and not necessarily give them even more than they thought they wanted, but just to kind of add like a little bit extra on top of that. And Kessler is a character. He's a wizard and he had a vest that's made of uh, wolf fur. Yes, I think so. Uh, unfortunately, um, we don't have Nick Goodwin here. This story is uh, his brainchild. He's my neighbor and friend in Chicago. Kessler is actually based on a real human being um, who is one of the uh, people who run a famous bar in Chicago called the Liars Club. J while Jeremy was constrained, kind of confined to uh, Gary's um, physical traits, just about everything else is all Jeremy. Can I say something about Jeremy? He said that the scripts are there and he doesn't have to do a lot of thinking. He does a lot of thinking. He is uh, fantastic to work with because I have in my mind's eye what, I, what story I want to tell, you know, and in my mind, that takes maybe nine panels on this page or seven or 14 panels on this page. But in Jeremy's eye, because Jeremy can tell a story, which not every artist can, in Jeremy's eye, maybe those nine panels are better done in seven, or maybe those nine panels are better done in 23. I don't know. Uh, but Jeremy will come back and tell the story that I meant to tell but it'll be a collaboration when it's done from that to, you know, you've heard of Kirby Crackles. We have Megert Magic Mist uh, in, in our books. He says he came in a little bit after the story had been cooked a little bit, but this Monsters and Midways is all uh, Jeremy visually. We are lucky for it. Collaborative efforts, obviously, when it comes to a writer and an artist or, or co-creators always interesting to see because everyone has their own creative experience and, and talent what is it about working with each other that sets you apart from maybe other duos of the past in the comic industry it's hard to know how you know a lot of other people work uh, but i mean i know that like with chuck and i there's just so much like flexibility between the two of us with the way that we that we execute the pages and i think that that that's a really big a big plus for the two of us and then also you know with nick getting the information into the script that we want to have and then getting that in the best possible format for like how it works you know on a comic page which is another nice thing about Chuck scripts also, as you can tell, he's writing specifically, like he's writing a comic script. A lot of times writers will write a script like they're watching it like on a TV or a movie screen. And you can always read those scripts and know immediately how that they're processing it. But the nice thing with Chuck's is I'm definitely like reading a comic script, which is one of the things that's really helpful. The, the flexibility that the two of us have together, I think is, and then also with Nick is probably, probably like our biggest like asset in terms of like our team working together. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, what Jeremy just said is true. We're kind of loose. At the same time, we're all disciplined. We all know our craft. The least experienced member of our team uh, is Nick Goodwin. That's a fact. You know, Nick Goodwin is the person who thought it up. Nick is my neighbor and my friend. He called me up one day 
And he said, um, like most comic book people, if you write or draw comics in any way, shape or form, you will have a family member or a friend or a neighbor who will say, <laughs> no, it makes a good comic, right? And then they'll say something. And then Jeremy can probably agree with this. Then you, you smile and you nod and you like, oh, yeah, okay, sure, yeah, good idea. Bye. <laughs> How do I get out of this room? Uh, Nick did it. And um, the more he kept talking, the more I, I sat there thinking, holy shit, this, is, this, this idea doesn't suck. It's fantastic. He had absolutely no experience um, writing anything. He, he had this idea in his head. And he's a child of, uh, child of the uh, 70s and 80s. So Nick and I uh, uh, kind of formed it into a story. And I wrote the script. We needed an artist. And I knew exactly who I wanted to work with because Jeremy and I had known each other for about a year by then. We almost worked together on another book, but COVID hit. So I immediately called Jeremy. So Jeremy, you know, his, his game is on, my game is on. So both of us know our craft, but we're also real loose. We fly, fly a little bit loose. There's really not a lot of rules. And that's, that's the best way I can explain it. You know, looking at uh, both of your careers as a whole, you both have a ver wide variety of experiences, which I, I love. And, and we could talk hours on, on each, everyone's career in general, which means we have to have you back on the show later on, maybe this year or, or next year. But what is the most important quality about being a writer and a comic artist in today's industry? I've always thought that a, that a comic book creator or any, I, I don't care if you're a comic book creator or if you are um, the person who answers the phones at an insurance agency, you need, um, but you, you need, there's three qualities. And if you have two of the three qualities, especially in comics, I think you can make it. If you have three, you're golden. Um, those three qualities are, first of all, speed. Can you make deadline? If you can make deadline, that's a good thing. Number two is likability, personality. Can you get along with people? Are you not a dick? That's a second quality. And third is talent. So if you have speed and talent, you can kind of be a dick and people will deal with you. If you have speed and likability, you can get by and do a okay book. People will still work with you because they like you and you're making deadlines. Or if you are skilled and likable, then they don't worry about the deadlines so much. We've all seen a million books come out six months late by that amazing writer or artist. And we're frustrated, but we still buy it when it comes. You know, if you have all three, you're golden. If you have two of the three, I think you can make it in comics as long as you are focused and, and, and you put the effort in. That's what I think. Building the world itself then and, and drawing the world, of course, in 1976, uh, Chicago there, why was that setting and that part of the world at that time period important for this story? It's just fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, Chicago is where Nick and I live. Uh, Jeremy's from Dallas, Texas, and we have never... And I think he'll agree with us. We've never held that against him. <laughs> you know, other people, you know, Jeremy has been fighting that disability for a long time. But uh, Chicago is a great city. Nick and I both live here. We both grew up here. The 1970s is just damn fun. Uh, the music was awesome. Airbrushed conversion vans. The clothing was ridiculous cool. Everything about the 70s is, is just a blast. Maybe not the colors. Avocado green. What is that? That mustard yellow. Uh, yeah. Maybe not so much, but everything else, pretty damn cool. The seventies are are were fun. We love working in the seventies in this book, but this book spans time. Monsters and Midways uh, has everything from Vietnam era uh, war scenes to Pompeii to uh, the Salem witch trials. We, we will um, hit uh, I, I, you know King Arthur's. Uh, uh, Knights of the Round Table with uh, Morgana and Merlin. But 1970s Chicago is uh, pretty cool. Uh, one of my favorite pages so far that Jeremy drew is of a 1970s Cadillac driving on the Chicago Skyway. Uh, pretty damn cool. Uh, you know, I love that, that time period. Now, I'm old enough to have lived in it. When you saw that you were in the varying time periods that you are drawing for, um, which one was your favorite? 
Well, so far we've spent the most time probably season seventies, kind of in the same about kind of about a ten year period or so, where we kind of bounce around a little bit. For me, it's it's interesting because I feel like when you look at the eras of things that we see in movies and TV shows and stuff like that, I feel like there's kind of two decades that you get you get to see the most, right? You see the '80s with Stranger Things, stuff of that variety, and then you have the '90s, and that's the kind of stuff that you see the most. You don't see a lot of stuff kind of taking place in the '70s, and for me that was interesting because one of the reasons I always enjoyed sci-fi was I liked to draw things and show things that you know people don't see every day. I want to show them something new and something different. And the nice thing about this is one, right? It's it's in an era that you're not seeing portrayed frequently, and then additionally on top of that. It's a very specific city. I have to have landmarks and I have to have buses from the city of Chicago in the 70s and make sure that those are right. You know, there's a lot of stuff like that that kind of goes into it that I don't normally do in most books because I'm in outer space with like flying cars and whatnot. What is an early experience where you learned that language had power? I can get heavy for a minute and I'm the product of a foster care system. I was in a number of foster homes and I lived in a a group home called Mooseheart in Aurora, Illinois, when I was a boy. Uh, And then I ultimately was adopted when I was 16. I've been homeless. I've lived in a pickup truck. I think one of those times when I thought that language was uh, important and and vital, if I'm being, you know, I I don't know if you wanted me to get this this, this, uh, deep, when someone who takes the job of parent who didn't give birth to you uh, says they love you, um, all of a sudden you feel safe when you're a kid and you are scared all the time because you never know what tomorrow brings. Uh, the simple words of I love you and believing it um, and, and feeling safe and being able to sleep that night. Um, I'd say that was one of the times when I first learned that language was powerful. I have a real light hearted comic book version um, answer to that question, but that's the serious heavy version a visual perspective when visual language had power for you as a creative artist yes so it's a green arrow story written by kevin smith and penciled by phil hester and inked by andy park and in this story uh you know the setup is that green arrow has been dead for a while and so this is green arrow being brought back into the dc uh like comics continuity and in this scene you have Oliver's, you know, former protege, Roy Harper, is sitting on a rooftop and he's reminiscing about Oliver training him. And in this scene, what Oliver is teaching him and what Roy is reminiscing about is all about the timing with which you choose to execute something. And it's the metaphor that he's using is Oliver's teaching him how to time his arrows. And so they're outside, they're in like a backyard. And Oliver has turned on a small faucet to where it's dripping water. And what he wants Roy to do is he wants Roy to fire the arrow and perfectly hit a drop of water as it's coming out of the faucet. And just the way that Phil executes like the passage of time, the emotion, and then like Roy getting frustrated and just like Oliver, you know, focusing him and like showing him how to do it and then executing it. It's just, it's just one of, in my opinion, the best, like, executed scenes i think that i've ever seen in the comic and the second i saw it i I truly understood for me what the the power of being able to tell a story like on a comic page gave you after the first time i I heard the story i went back i have the absolute version of that i didn't know there was an absolute version of that story i'm gonna have to get that because i have i have of phil's run i have two trades i have that one and then i have the first one after the end of that story where Kevin Smith left. And I forget who Brad Meltzer, somebody took Brad Meltzer. Meltzer. Uh, Jeremy, forget about it. Don't worry about it. When I, when I unpack, um, I will send it to you. Um, It's my gift to you. I love you to death. And I will (laughs) just send it to you. So don't worry about it. In both of your careers there, what was the first thing that you created where you thought, yes, I could do this as a career. Nothing creator owned. And, and, And I'm saying that, Uh, a little bit funny, but also serious because um, if you're a creator owner, 
uh, the odds are stacked against you. They just are. I'm not here to be a negative person. I'm, I'm not trying to say don't try or don't do it because I've clearly tried and done it a number of times. So I think the time where um, I, I thought, yeah, maybe I can do this as a career was the work for hire. When someone actually hired me and paid me to write a comic book that I didn't create, I've adapted a number of, uh, of novels. So I think the first time where I really thought maybe I could do this as a career. Look, I, I'm, I'm a very realistic person for transparent. I, I have a day job as well, but maybe I could do this as a career was when I adapted um, uh, Joe DeVito's uh, sequel to Marion C. Cooper's Kong, uh, King Kong. Uh, it was called Kong King of Skull Island. I sat there working on well, a pop culture icon. If there is somebody in the world that hasn't heard of King Kong, who is in an industrialized nation, probably even not industrialized nations, uh, I would be surprised. So when I worked on a pop culture icon like King Kong, I thought, oh, maybe, maybe. Mine was a little less uh, structured in that regard. When I first kind of was switching gears to comics, I had a day job that was not super fulfilling. And I was kind of realizing that I wanted to change gears in life. And I wanted there to be, um, you know, I was realizing that with the, the job I was doing, it was a job that I was eminently replaceable by anyone and it didn't make a difference. And that was something that was kind of very important to me. And when I started thinking about that, I started thinking about other stuff like, you know, I'm doing this job, you know, I want to do something that matters if I do it, you know, and I feel like comics is that way. And, and it's the same way for every, every member of the team in comics. If somebody else had written monsters in midways and handed me the script, it would be completely different. Right. The same thing. If somebody else drew Chuck a monsters in midways page, it would be, it wouldn't look even remotely the same. And so I love that with comics, like I wanted it to be something to where, you know, it mattered if I did it. And then the third thing is, you know, and this is a little kind of floofy, but like I wanted it to be something that had a kind of a benefit to sort of like the world at large, you know, and I feel like comics give people a lot of enjoyment I know they certainly have me and they've made my life better. And so I wanted to kind of contribute to that, that circle as well. I decided to start drawing again. And, you know, I was doing like a little bit of fan art stuff. I didn't really care about doing fan art and I still don't now. And I really just wanted to draw actual comic books. And so I just started drawing my own book and, it, you know, it was definitely not awesome. I was, oh, okay. you say, I was always like, I'm like, I'm always like very aware of like where my skill level is at. And so, you know, it didn't stop me from drawing those first few pages and whatever, and then like hopping on a plane to go to C2E2 and showing it to a bunch of professionals now. And I look back and I'm like, oh, that's a little rough. But, you know, it was a fun, it was a fun book. And it was, I definitely learned a crap ton about making comics on that book. You know, it, it literally just, it started with, with those, those ideas about like why I wanted to make comics and then just, just going in full blast. And they, you know, just knowing that's what I wanted to do. So then Chuck, what was the hardest scene for you to write in this book? That is super easy. And I would not have been done without Jeremy's help. Jeremy, no, you know what I'm going to say, right? I wrote the entire script for issue oh, one. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. I wrote the entire script for issue one, except for a two page spread that Nick and I had worked on <laughs> um, from a story perspective called History of the World Part One. This is a great story about collaboration because our goal was in a two-page spread to tell the entire history of magic in, in our world, in our universe, in, in that two pages. I, I couldn't do it. I would say, Jeremy, yeah, two-page spread's coming tomorrow. Three weeks later, yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I just kept doing it. And then Jeremy finally just got tired of me um, and said, can I, can I talk to you for a second? And I was like, I'm sorry. I know I have to have this done. You've done pretty much every page other than this two page spread in the, in the comic. And he gave me a suggestion, the simplest of suggestions. And he was right. Ultimately I look at it as a, as a, I, I take the, the L on this on, on issue one, because uh, I, I, I pride myself on if I'm told 22 pages by the publisher, I do 22 pages ultimately because of Jeremy's, fantastic and simple suggestion that never occurred to me. We called the publisher Second Sight and we asked him for two more pages and, it, and then it was easy. 
but it, those two pages, uh, History of the World Part One, um, where we told the history of magic in the Monsters of Mid uh, Midway's universe, were the two hardest pages, not only in this series, but the hardest pages I've ever, ever, ever wrote. And Jeremy made them look fantastic. His suggestion helped me out of an enormous jam. Was that also the hardest uh, pages for you to draw then? No, those actually didn't end up being too difficult because I think one of the things where Chuck was having trouble with was he had a lot of stuff he wanted to get on the pages. He had a lot of ground he wanted to cover, but at the same time, on those two pages is we were introducing one yeah. of the three main characters. We were introducing yeah. Kat, and it was the first yeah. time you were going to see her. When she comes in, she, she doesn't know Dave. She already knows Kessler, and Kessler and Dave are sitting in a Mexican buffet restaurant in Chicago. She, she shows up to sit down and to meet Dave and they just have kind of like sort of like just kind of popping in and sliding in the booth. But I wanted it to be where it's, you know, you had a little bit more of like an introduction to where you saw her on the page and you're like, okay, when you give the introduction, you know, the character a good bit of real estate, it lets the, you know, the reader know, okay, this is somebody who's going to be really important to the story. And so what we basically did was, kind of added a couple pages and then gave Kat her intro, a couple pages of her sort of talking to Dave and telling Dave a little bit about the world, the magic world. And then the next two pages were for Chuck to like do write his history of the world thing. And so then he could have everything from dinosaurs mutated by dark magic to all of the, the okay. wizards fighting that. Well, yeah, like all, all that stuff. And, th and then we could fit it. And then all of a sudden it like it really wasn't that difficult. I think the hardest for me, there was a scene and it wasn't as much hard. It just took a long time was we have a scene where you have four got four soldiers in the Vietnam jungle uh, walking through the jungle at night and it's raining. Oh, and that that just took a really long time because. You know, like I'm working black and white and I've got, I've got to get a lot of stuff in there. So I'm not I'm not zooming in super close on uniforms, but like I got to make sure that as close as I can, that 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 the weapons are era correct and the uniforms are as correct as I can get them. You know, knowing that, you know, when you're Googling stuff like, you know, it's may not always be exactly right. That And that was really what probably took the longest was that page of just getting those dudes walking through that jungle that page is um that he's referring to that jeremy's referring to is fantastic yeah i'm um i i play destiny on um, xbox one quite often uh so does jeremy uh, do you do is do you yep. as well okay you know when you're when you play an fps like that um you know I'm, I'm part of the clan actually jeremy's in this clan now but uh you know, I showed this page to a couple of my friends one of which his name is mike he's in our uh he's in our destiny clan He's a, uh, a veteran, and uh, uh, there's a reticle panel that Jeremy drew that is insane perfect, you know, when he's looking through the sites. Uh, I don't know if you know that, Jeremy, but uh, Mike uh, Night Terror talked about how fantastic that panel was, and he's oh, literally, good. He's literally a, you know, a, a veteran, um, and, and he, he thought that panel was fantastic. Good. I like that panel. And then at the bottom of the page. Oh, the, the was, whole run. Yeah, it was it was fun because we had to show we needed to show, you know, it's night. So you've got like trees and stuff, but then we needed to have glowing eyes popping up, you know, kind of in the darkness. And so the way that I did it was I drew one of like the uh, one of the assault rifles, the M16 is kind of at the bottom of the page, framing the bottom of the page. And then so you're just sort of like looking over the top your view is just over the top of the gun. And then you're seeing all the eyes kind of like pop up as you move from left to right across the page. It was enough and joy. I mean, I can't say this enough. I, I have been extremely lucky. You say, Kurt, that I have a resume. I don't really have that big of a resume. I've worked on a few books in my life, but during that, those few books, I've got, I've been able to work with artists like, I mean, well, before the show started, I talked about George Perez inking our covers on our first ever book. Um, I worked with Norm Brayfogle. Um, I've worked with Phil Hester and Kevin Mellon, and um, I've worked with a number of different uh, creators. But um, man, uh, Jeremy's sense of page design, it's like, I, I, I've said this before, it's like writer's Christmas every single time he sends me a text. He's like, you know, I, I see a text that says Jeremy Meggert image. And I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it's like it could be two thirty in the afternoon, and uh, I could be in a, like um, you know in this COVID world in my in my day job, I could be in a Zoom meeting, and um, you know what what the Zoom what the people in my insurance Zoom meeting will see, I'll hear a ding, and it'll be Jeremy, and it'll say image attached, and this is what they'll I, I'll be I'll be listening to them talking, and and this is what they'll see. You know, I don't know if they if they know what I'm looking at, but uh, you know that's that's essentially what 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 I experience every single time Jeremy sends me a text um, that has a, the latest page. It's Writer's Christmas. What is your creative kryptonite? This will sound funny. I am just always looking at a lot of different artists, and I mean, I probably have four or five that are my main influences right now. But I mean, everything I see is like seeps into what I'm doing at any point in time. And so I have to sometimes keep make an effort to like not let those things affect me in terms of like making our comic look consistent the whole way through. Because I don't want it to like I always want people to look at it and, you know, it's cool if they can see like who my influences are. But I don't want it to like all of a sudden one page looks like it's, you know, all of a sudden drawn by somebody different. And so that's a, that's a struggle for me. But, you know, the other thing, too, is there's times I just tend to want to draw. I don't want to say too much, but like like render too heavily. And that is definitely like a big kryptonite for me is not over rendering the drawing, you know, trying to stay away from all the super busy cross hatching because that is not it's something I enjoy looking at but it's not like a skill set I have. And so I try to stay away from it, like in my pages, because every time I do it and I look back on it later, it's one of the things I look back and I'm like, yeah, I wish I hadn't done that. So that's the kind of drawing that for me is my kryptonite that I try to stay away from when I'm illustrating pages. When I'm really in the zone, I'll sit down and I'll write a script from beginning to end and I won't get up unless it's to the bathroom or something until it's done. So the kryptonite for me is a blank screen. I think that's a lot of writers until the first words are down. And a lot of that is outline because there's nothing there. It, it, before you outline a, a story, there's, there's only thought. So when you actually put words on screen, then it becomes real. Once it becomes real, for me, it's fluid. It's just go time. But actually, for me, the most intimidating thing in the world is a blank screen. I think that's, like I said, for a lot of writers, but that's my kryptonite, a blank screen. Once I can actually put words on it, I'm maybe not as good as, but I'm fast as Kerouac. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is uh, when I write a script, I don't even know if Jeremy knows this, but when I write a script, I don't have dialogue. I don't have panel description. I don't have uh, I don't have the name of the person saying the dialogue. I don't have anything like that. I just write. And then when it's when the script is done, then I go back and format it to this dialogue by this guy, this dialogue by this guy, this panel, this panel, this panel. I almost don't even include pronunciation, grammar, uh, commas, nothing. Um, I just I just care whack the shit out of that. And, and uh like I said, maybe not as good as Jack Kerouac, but uh, same kind of thought process, streamline, boom, in, but blank page. It's difficult. Yeah, the, the blank page is like taunting you. The blinking cursor is just judging you for everything that you're not writing down. Yeah, it just looks at you and it's like, you loser. You know, the, 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 the cursor is just like, you talentless hack. Like, yeah. What are you even doing here? It's just screaming at you. Before I get into these questions, is there anything I haven't touched upon that those are watching and listening should know about? The comic book industry is a um, uh, is made up of a bunch of idiots if they don't hire Jeremy Megger after this series is over to do every major character at Marvel and DC. I am okay with that. Yeah, we can we can run with that for sure. At what point are we good enough? Well, I think that implies complacency. Complacency is the enemy of creativity. So my answer would be never. Chuck and I think are both very similar in that, you know, that's, there's always, always pushing to do better, you know, on every single page that we execute. What is something that everyone should experience once in their lifetime? 
I'm, I would say, uh, having to work a sales job, a service-based sales job, man. Like I had one for a long time and man, like you really, you really see like, you know, what it's like to deal with people and it gives you a true appreciation for, you know, other people that are out there working hard and, you know, you see like how you get treated. And I, it's also, I feel like, you know, an invaluable teacher for knowing that you have to, in order to succeed in a lot of areas, you have to produce results and that, that works, you know, and with our Kickstarter, it'll work, you know, when our comic book comes out in May, you know, like Chuck and I've talked about, you know, we want this book to be second sights, like most successful comic that they've ever done. And we want it to like be that hands down for them. I think that a lot of that stems from, you know, Chuck's experience in sales. And then, you know, my experience before switching over to comics. Damn. He's right. Um, I, I, I am in sales every day in my, in my regular life, uh, non-comic book life. And uh, a sales job is, um, you know, the true test of um, patience and, and um, empathy and, and everything else. I, I, you know, what I was going to say before Jeremy said his fantastic answer was um, uh, unconditional acceptance and love. Everybody should experience that from something other than your dog. <laughs> because my dog, you know, I could go murder uh, 19 people today. My dog would be like, how are you? I love you. Um, but uh, by the way, I have never murdered anyone. Uh, unconditional acceptance and love. Um, if you could experience that in your life, then you are uh, lucky. A good creative partner mm -hmm. is also something everyone should experience. Yeah. Jeremy? Sure. What's the second wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? The second wisest thing? Yeah. Well, shit. That's a, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I could I could easily tell you the wisest thing um, that was from uh, Norm Bravogel. I I think the the second wisest thing because you're talking about in this career of comics, correct? I think the second wisest thing that I've ever heard. Uh, I could say a bunch of things that Phil Hester told me because he's literally my mentor and one of the greatest people in all of comics. You know, I'm, I'll I'll continue the Jeremy Megger. Uh, Love Fest. Yesterday, we learned that there was a month delay in our book being solicited uh, by Second Sight Publishing uh, in previews. I called Jeremy and I said, and I was scared to death because this is Jeremy's, this is one of Jeremy's first efforts. Uh, and I said, Jeremy, I'm really sorry, but uh, we're not going to be in the February previews. We're going to be in the March previews. All the advice Phil gave me, all the advice Norm Brayfogel gave me, George Perez, all these guys gave me, it, it was great. But uh, Jeremy's answer was, okay, I, I, maybe it's not advice, but maybe it was an example. You let the shit that you can't control roll off, handle the stuff you can't control, and go make a good comic. And that's what Jeremy told me in, in those two letters, O and K. And I, I felt better. So that's the second best advice I've ever received. Jeremy, your turn. Well, you know, it's funny because since I've started this out, I got to this game later than what a lot of people do. You know, I really started pursuing this like, oh, like mid mid 30s or so. I've never had a mentor. You know, whenever you see people taking on mentors, you see the words, uh, you know, new young artists and things like that pop up. And, you know, I fit half of that as a qualifier for a lot of people, but uh, the other half I do not. And so I, you know, honestly, like I've never had a mentor like in, in this, in this journey, but I would probably say the, the best advice, the, the second best advice, it was really funny at my first kind of con when I was taking this book that I was doing and it's called, was called space beards. And it was that book I mentioned earlier and I was showing it to everybody. And uh, there was an artist, his name is Aaron Cooter, and he currently works for Marvel doing all kinds of amazing stuff. He looked at my work. He was like, you need to get some French curves. And I was like, what are French curves? And he basically had to tell me about these things that are rulers, but they have like round edges and curves on, on them. So that way, like your lines don't look like ass, basically. He didn't say that, but that's basically what it was. <laughs> 
So it was awesome. get get some French curbs, and that's probably pretty much probably like the best, the second best like advice ever. Well, I mean that's, that's a cool phrase. question. Thank yeah. you. Oh. <laughs> Uh, that's probably where the phrase, um, you know, draw me like one of your French girls comes from. So, you know, get some French curves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> probably not, but I like how it sounds. We'll run with that. Um, <laughs> everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I mean, obviously I would say like a big one was that Green Arrow comic with Phil. Uh, another one is, and this is really funny, like a lot of people read comics and draw when they're kids and i definitely did that and read a lot of stuff and you know we take road trips and have comics in the car and go pick them up at like little bookstores in the mall at the spinner racks but when i was in high school i wanted to learn how to draw people and i was like you know what i'm gonna go get some comic books and do it that way which is a terrible idea in retrospect you know but uh i did that's what i did and i went and picked up just went into a comic shop and I was like, ah, oh, I'll get some Wolverine books, whatever, because I like Wolverine, right? Because it was in high school. And I picked up, it was like Wolverine 75, and it was by Larry Hama and Adam Kubert. And it was the first issue of Wolverine, kind of like right after his Adamantium was ripped out uh, by Magneto. And spoiler, it was funny because I opened that book up, and that was the first time I ever had really looked at a comic and recognized that not all artists were of equal skill level. And I just remember reading Adam Kubert's work on that page and not truly understanding it, how good he actually is. That was the first time I ever truly kind of became, became aware of that was probably with like with Adam Kubert, like on that Wolverine book. So I would probably say, you know, the Adam Kubert Wolverine era, uh, Phil Hester, you know, Green Arrow, and then another big thing for me is the, the kind of spawn era when McFarlane was on it. And then you had Capullo and McFarlane in, in that era too. And those are probably like a few of my biggest, especially for like for early on. For me, number one, it's number one uh, period. You asked for one or two, uh, but I'll go for, first of all, my number one is Frank Miller. I'm 51 in 1986 when I was 16 years old. Uh, Dark Knight Returns came out. I read that book, uh, all four of them. Uh, it was before the trade paperback. I read all four of the prestige issues. The scene where um, two faces, a uh, henchman who is on crutches and has a neck brace and everything, uh, comes back to two faces hideout and he says, Face, it was the bat. The, the place is deserted and Batman is waiting. Frank Miller writes, this and it resonates with me to the point where once I'm out of the business world, when I retire, I'm even getting this tattooed on my arm. Batman shows up and, and he, you know, and, and the, the guy on crutches is backing up and backing up because he's afraid of Batman and he falls through this piece of glass onto the fire escape. The, the henchman says, You can't hurt me, I have rights. And Batman says, You have rights, lots of rights. Sometimes I count them just to make myself feel crazy. But right now you have a piece of glass shoved into a major artery in your arm. Right now you're bleeding to death. Right now I'm the only person in the world who can get you to a hospital in time. And that changed my whole world. Everything in my entire, my whole world went, what the fuck? This is insane. And Frank Miller owned me after that. Everything Frank Miller does, I love. I don't care, period. I love Frank Miller. He's number one for me. Number two, writer-wise, man, there's so many, you know? Uh, you know, Alan Moore, uh, Phil. Um, you know, for, as much as Phil is a visual uh, person for, for Jeremy, um, Phil is also an amazing writer. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to call him friend. There's Norm. There's all these different storytellers and artists and writers and everything. But if I'm going to talk about pure uh, inspiration and, and heroes, I, you know, I would have to go the cliche route and say Alan Moore and everything he did with V for Vendetta and Watchmen. So Frank Miller and Alan Moore. 
From a professional perspective, you are both creatively talented people in writing and artistry. You have done many things in your careers and you will continue to do many things uh, with various projects that you either do solo or do together. So from a professional perspective, you're both successful. Do you consider yourselves personally successful? I think that goes back to complacency. No, <laughs> I don't think I'll ever think of myself as successful. I've sold three options to Hollywood for TV shows that have never been made. Um, I've been published. I've, I've been in worldwide, like I said, pop culture icons. Uh, I used to think that the, that the bar for success is working at Marvel or DC. I'm old enough now to truly not really give a shit about that. Um, you know, Marvel and DC, if you want to hire me, great. You should hire Jeremy. He's much more talented. Uh, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there is a bar for success that I'm ever going to feel that I hit. You talk about kryptonite from another, another piece of kryptonite would be complacency. If I, if I get complacent or satisfied, I'm, I'm dead creatively. So no. Personally successful. I mean, it kind of depends on what, what area, you know, that you're looking at in, in terms of a professional thing. I'm usually very in the moments, you know, and I try to stay in the moment when I'm working on something. So, you know, I'm always, of course, like looking out for what, you know, like obviously we have six issues of Monsters and Midways. And so I have to have a gig hopefully lined up for when that's over. This is my first published comic. And so I remember the day that, you know, we, you know, we, we got the contracts and we were signing those to send them back. And that was really exciting. But man, the second I signed it, I was just immediately like ready to hit the table and, and work on pages. And so, you know, there's, there's a star Wars, you know, saying that, you know, be mindful of the future, but not at the expense of the moment. And so I'm very much usually I'm trying to stay like in the moment with that, but in terms of like, you know, personally successful, you know, you know, I'm always enjoying the journey of like my comic career and where it's going, but, you know, outside of professionalism, you know, in my, you know, in my personal life outside of that, you know, married to an amazing, incredible person who is definitely makes uh, my comic career possible. So in that regard, I am incredibly successful. And all of us are very lucky for Josie. Mecker. Yes. <laughs> We love Josie Meggert. She yes. makes Jeremy Meggert possible. That is 1,000% accurate. Yes. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I mean, I just, I move on, man. Like, let's say I draw a page and I'm not 100% happy with it. I mean, are you ever 100% happy with anything, with any any piece of art? Not necessarily, you know, but like you, you look at like what you can learn from it. It's in the rear view mirror immediately. And I don't dwell on it. Learn what you can from it, and then it's it's gone. And that that to me is how I how I do it. You know, failure's a stepping stone. Failure is just a step. If I counted up the times that a publisher declined me, that would outweigh my acceptance uh, responses by fifty to one, without a doubt. I'm lucky enough to know a lot of people. I have direct lines to a number of publishers right now where even if you see a, a publisher that says we're not accepting submissions, I probably can submit to them. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that's it. But none of them said yes yet. And that's okay. Every declination is fine because it's a stepping stone. It's a learning experience. Jeremy alluded to it. He lived in a world where he was in a sales position. I still do. People say no. You let it bounce off you, and, and you and you go to the next one. The NFL and football. My son is a my son is a college football player. Football teams have a slogan: "Next man up." You deal with adversity and you move on. You get up in the morning and you and you live that day. I welcome failure. Uh, I welcome no's. I welcome declines because that's just one step closer to the yes, and that's where you got to live. Uh, you know, and that's that's a great thing I feel like to hit on because a lot of you know, comic books is in the industry is, is rejection letters, you know, like you're going to get them and get it. But then it's, you know, like I, you know, and you know, I always read the thing where, you know, you have people like, I have a hundred, I have all 100 of my rejection letters or a hundred and I'm like, I don't have any of them. I nope. don't, I don't, I just don't, I don't keep them. I don't care. 
you know, there was one point where it was really funny where, you know, I was submitting books and not even really hearing back from people. But then there was a point where, <laughs> and I thought this was, this is funny because like, I actually heard back from, started hearing back from image where they were telling me no. And I was like, well, I mean, I guess I'm getting good enough that they're telling me no. <laughs> Hell yes. You know? So, but, and it, but then again, then, then as soon as that, like, I was like, oh, well, okay, good. But then as soon as that got passed, I was like, all right, cool, whatever. And then I was just immediately back to whatever I was working on. So. I agree completely. I have zero of my um, uh, declination notices from any publisher ever. Uh, don't care. Um, next, next man up. Jeremy's right. If you live in those, that's just living in negative. Uh, let's move on. Next, 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 next stop. The younger generation is looking at your work, both of you, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or a artist or something else creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? To do, um, to create. It all comes together with what we were talking about before with the blank page. My son has no interest in, uh, in comic books or uh, he's a fantastic artist, but he has no interest in comic books and he has no interest in being a, in a creative career. He wants to do business. He's Michael J. Fox uh, in family ties in our house. He, he may even be a Republican. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, my point being just do. My adoptive father told me, you know, you want to talk about the best piece of advice. Uh, my adoptive father told me, Chuck, son, I don't give a fuck. And he cussed a lot, by the way. I don't give a fuck if you want to be a garbage man or president of the United States, not knocking garbage men. If you want to be whatever the, whatever the hell you want to do, be the what you want to do. Be the president, be the garbage man, be the doctor. Uh, what he was trying to say is uh, if, you, if you do something do it to the absolute best you can do. Put everything you have in it. Don't, don't hold back, you know? Um, and, uh, and I live that. So I, I think that the younger generation should do what every generation has done, which is put everything you have into what you're trying to do and show the future generations, people that will read, you, read it after you're long dead and buried, uh, and will gain inspiration because that was the best you had. And they'll say, you know what? Frank Miller, Alan Moore, Phil Hester, those guys, God, you know, God willing, Chuck Satterley, Jeremy Maggart, those guys, they knew what they were doing and they were really good at it and they put everything in and I'm going to do what they did. So that would be my answer. Mine is very similar to Chuck's, you know, it's in <clears throat> specifically in regards to making comics. It's that you need to make comics, you know, and it's always, there's the thing that like, you know, tell the stories that you want to tell, you know, but, but I feel like the most important part of that is tell stories and, and make comics that you can put in people's hands, because if that's what you're inspired by, you know, whether it's a physical comic or it's a webtoon or it's digital, something like comiXology, you know, make it and get it done so you can put it in someone's hand because in my personal opinion, that's the most important part, right? Nobody in five years is going to care that you did a cool looking piece of Wolverine fan art, right? That, that stuff doesn't, doesn't stand the test of time. And if you want to have something that that's truly going to reach people, you know, you need to tell a story and you need to be able to finish that story to where you can be like, here, read this. This is a comic that I worked on, you know, and that, that to me is the most is, is a huge, huge part of that equation. Good answers from me both. And I greatly appreciate you for coming on the show. And I hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking. You survived. We did. We appreciate being on. Before I let you go, this is, <laughs> we have to have you at least plug the Kickstarter and plug yourselves on social media. So where can we find you both? How can we support you both? Uh, not only on this Kickstarter, but in the future. Well, I, I, I'm at, um, you can find our Kickstarter links at Defective Comics with an X.com. That's Defective, C-O-M-I-X.com. And our Kickstarter link is there. 
Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Comics Chuck. You can look up our Facebook Defective Comics uh, group page. Uh, I'll let Jeremy talk about all of his stuff. He's he's on Instagram. I'm on Instagram, but I need to help my Instagram game um, like Jeremy. But uh, I'll let Jeremy talk about where he's at because you can find these links to the Kickstarter at any of those pages. Yeah, so mine are I'm mostly on Instagram and Twitter, and it's Jeremy Megert's Art, just all one word. And yeah, Instagram and Twitter, and you can find the links to the Kickstarter. You know, all of our social media pages, the defective comic stuff. I mean, if you just go to really any of those areas, I mean, we'll have everything for you ready to go. Beautiful. Love it. Well, thank you again both for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. And I definitely want to have you both back on in the future for sure, too. So let's let's try to do something later on in the year or next year if possible. Yeah, sounds good to me. Thank you, Kurt, for uh, for your support and your hospitality, man. We appreciate you. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated than our website, unfortunately, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.